very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is difficult to be here today. It is in many respects a debate that many of us wish was not happening. It is a real sorrow that I rise to respond to the Government's motion. Mr Speaker, the reality of Brexit is now laid before us. Broken promises of taking back control from a Government that is so out of control. 21 ministerial resignations, communities, countries, households divided, our politics stale. A Prime Minister fighting for her political life. Mr Speaker, the past number of months have been filled with political drama, theatre, squabbles and chaos. From crisis to crisis, this government hangs on by a thread. But beneath all of this is the real reality, the hard, cold truth that this is a moment of self-harm in our history. History has a way of teaching us lessons, if only we would listen. At a moment such as this, I reflect on someone that we regard as an icon. Winnie Ewing, Madame yeah, yeah, yeah. who came into this House 51 years ago for the seat of Hamilton, represented the Highlands and Islands at the European Parliament, and fought hard to make sure that Scotland benefited from its membership of the Madame European McCoy. Parliament, something I can see right throughout my constituency, with all the signs of projects that were funded by European money. And we had a welcome year in the European Parliament, and indeed Winnie played such an important part in the development of that institution. We've heard of the importance of Erasmus today, and it holds a special place in the SNP's heart, because it was Winnie Ewing who chaired the European Parliament's European and Culture Committee on Erasmus when it was established in the 1980s. That's the legacy of someone that fought hard to make sure that all of us benefited from that European membership. And if I can contrast the approach that we've had from Europe with this place, and I want to quote from the great lady herself. Time after time, on matters great and small, we are still standing on the sidelines, mutely accepting what is decided elsewhere, instead of raising our voices and making our own choices. Scotland's much-vaunted partnership of Jonah and the whale. Mr Speaker, respect for human dignity, human rights, freedom, democracy, equality and the rule of law, these are the core values of the European Union. Values that have united, not divided us as citizens of Europe, now for many years. Values that are now ingrained in our society, to be cherished and protected, not discarded or eroded. I am proud and privileged to be a citizen of the European Union. Mr Speaker, the European Union has been the greatest peace project in our lifetime. A peace project born out of the horrors of two world wars that ripped Europe apart. A project that has gone on to change the course of our communities and improve citizens' rights and opportunities across the continent, not just now. A project that I still believe is worth defending, and we will, on these benches, defend that. A project that has enabled our generations to travel, to work, to live and to thrive across all countries that are within the European Union. Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, today I come here with a heavy heart, with the deepest regret that the opportunities that I had to work in Amsterdam, but also to travel throughout Europe in my working career, to learn from the best and the brightest across Europe, will be taken from our children. Because that's what we're doing. Embracing the diversity of European culture has enriched so many of us. The exciting opportunities to live and work in Amsterdam, or Barcelona, or Brussels, or Berlin, or Copenhagen, or Vienna, or so many other places. So many choices and opportunities that our generation had to work and to develop friendships across Europe. Mr Speaker, to learn from the rich diversity that Europe has to offer, to benefit from the experiences of different cultures, to form friendships with those like us who celebrated being European citizens 
with shared rights. The right to live and work across the EU is to be ended as a right for the next generation. Mr Speaker, I have in the gallery today an ex-colleague from Amsterdam when I worked for a bakery ingredients company, someone whose friendship was formed out of the opportunity that I had to work in Amsterdam. Our friendship is a celebration of the success of the opportunities the EU membership gave to all of us. Here, 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 that here. right to live and work together across the EU is to be ended as a right for the next generation. That automatic right to benefit for career opportunities to be removed. Opportunities to benefit from an inclusive Europe swapped for the constraints of an inward-looking United well, Kingdom. I thank my right honourable friend giving way. Most people in this chamber know that my husband is German. What not all of them will know is that his mother was Polish and his parents were not allowed to marry. The child they had together was taken from them. His mother was a forced labourer and his father was lifted by the Gestapo. And long before we ended up in this mess, he used to celebrate that in one generation he could live and work where he wanted and marry who yeah. he loved. Yeah, yeah, and in one number. more generation, we're taking it away. Yeah. It's shameful. Yeah. 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 I mean, I thank well my said. honourable colleague and friend for that explanation of what we are doing. Colleagues, we must reflect on where we are. And I appeal to everyone throughout this House to stop and think about that erudite explanation of what has happened in Europe over the last 70 or 80 years. Stop and enshrine the benefits of free movement of people that has enriched so many of us. It is not too late to turn back. I will uh, give way. I am very grateful to the honourable gentleman, and I am <clears throat> very proud to be the first ever Polish-born British Member of Parliament and celebrate the contribution that one million Poles have made to our country. But does he not share my concern that by offering or proposing another referendum, we could be giving wind to UKIP's sails, a party which is currently withering on the vine, which is falling apart. There will be a renaissance for UKIP if we have another referendum that overturns the previous result. Ian Blackburn. I must respectfully say to the honourable gentleman that we have to take this argument on. Yeah. 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 Migration has enriched us. Yeah. Yeah. So we come from the country of Scotland where our population has barely grown over the last 100 years, because where we have gone from 4.8 to just over 5 million people. If we do not have access to free movement of people, we are not going to be able to deliver sustainable economic growth. And I say respectfully to the honourable gentleman that there are thousands of Poles who have come to work in Scotland over the course of the last few years. Let me say to all of them, to each and every one of them that may be watching tonight, you are welcome. You are welcome because of the contribution that you make to our life, to our culture, to our economy. And the thought that we would take up the drawbridge and stop people coming to participate in the growth of the future of our country is quite frankly yeah, yeah. repugnant to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will fight with my colleagues yeah, to make sure that we remain an open society and we can continue to be enriched by those that want to come and live and make a contribution to our economy. Yeah, yeah. They are welcome and they will remain welcome. Yeah, yeah. Let me make some progress and then I will make a give way. Mr Speaker, in April 1988, when the single market campaign began, one prominent speaker stated a single market without barriers, visible or invisible, giving you direct and unhindered access to the purchasing power of over 300 million of the world's wealthiest and most prosperous people. We are putting the European community to work for ordinary people, for cheaper airfares, for more and better services, for consumer choice and product safety. Mr Speaker, that was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> Even Margaret Thatcher recognised that shared markets, collaboration and partnership in Europe was in all our interests. Many may be puzzled why I begin by expressing the sentiment and not directly the content of the Government's motion. I do so because it is right. Here, here. Yeah. It is right to remember the real loss that all of us will feel, and it is not simply the loss in this deal or any other. 
It is the fact that any deal, any deal, will mean a loss to our economy, to our society and our children. We in the SNP have long argued and continue to believe that staying in the European Union is the best option for Scotland and indeed for all parts of the United Kingdom. And when I hear the Prime Minister say the choice if we vote down this deal or no deal is staying in the European Union, I say yes, please. Because fundamentally, there is no option that is going to be better for our economy, for jobs and for our communities than staying in the European Union. And it is the height of irresponsibility of any government to bring forward a proposition that is going to make its people poorer. A proposition that is going to mean that people are going to lose their jobs. And we heard earlier from the previous Foreign Secretary that it was Project Fear about jobs. But let's look at the reality. Let's look at what we already know. 1,000 jobs lost from the European Banking Authority. 1,000 jobs lost from the European Medicines Agency. Mr Speaker, that's not Project Fear. That's the reality, and it's already happened. I will give way. Can I commend the uh, open? Can I commend the open uh, nature of the speeches given, in stark contrast to the capricious and solipsistic nonsense from the shadow, uh, the former, sorry, foreign secretary? But will he join me on the issue of EU nationals in calling on the government, even at this late stage, to drop the charge they intend to impose on EU nationals to keep rights that they already enjoy in this country right now. The cost of a passport might not be much to them, but it should be dropped as an act of goodwill. Of course, my hon. Friend is correct, and we simply should not be charging people to exercise the rights that they should have to be here. And I will go further, because of course we are discussing rejecting this deal, but we are also ruling out no deal. But the government should make it absolutely crystal clear in any scenario that the rights of all our EU citizens here will be protected. But you know, there's, a, there's another factor when we discuss the rights of EU citizens here, but also UK citizens in Europe. That UK citizens that are currently in Europe will only have rights to stay and live and work in that one territory. The rights that they have had up until now of living, of travelling and working throughout the European Union are to be ended. Yep. Yep. What a disgrace. And many of these European citizens, I know of people that live in Belgium but work throughout the European continent, are going to have those rights countermanded. That, Mr Speaker, is a disgrace. Let me make some, let me make some progress and I will, I will move on. Mr Speaker, whilst we respect that England and Wales voted to leave the European Union, we ask that the government respect that Scotland did not. However, it is clear that the UK Government has no intention of respecting the will of the Scottish people, as the deal that we are asked to support will do nothing to bring harm and hardship socially, economically and politically to Scotland. And, Mr Speaker, we must remember that this fight, this huge struggle and burden on our society that now faces us from Brexit comes from the Tory party and the Tory party alone. Year, year, year. The European debate was an internal battle for the Tories and they drove it into the public discourse, into a bigger battlefield, not because of the interests of the citizens of this country, but because of the deep divisions and narrow interests within the Tory party itself, not outside of it. We know today that it does not have to be so. We know that the Prime Minister's deal will be voted down. We know it. She knows it. This House should also vote to remove no deal from the table. There is no scenario where we will be wealthier with Brexit. No government should expose its citizens to economic risk. Here, here. That is what will happen with Brexit. The government's own analysis shows that to be the case. Mr Speaker, we must stop this madness. We can go back to the people of these islands and be honest with them on the consequences of Brexit. Today, the Advocate General Manuel Campos Sanchez Bordona has advised that EU law would allow the UK to unilaterally revoke Article 50. Until the of the we can hit the reset button. Year, year, year. That, year. Prime Minister, is called leadership. Year, year, year. On that point, will he give way? I'll give way. I thank him for giving way.
Uh, he touched on this point earlier, but does he agree with me that actually perhaps the people who are most affected by this are UK, UK citizens who live in the EU, where it will require 27 countries in 27 different ways to address their concerns and their issues who are perhaps most vulnerable in what the government are seeking to impose on us. I, I, I fully agree and I touched on that later earlier and it just shows how this Brexit deal is a complete shambles and we need to yeah, yeah. think again. Mr Speaker, a future in which Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England continues to flourish side by side as equal partners. As equal partners. These words are not mine. These are the words of the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. A Prime Minister who promised us partner. equal partners, but her rhetoric is in ruins as her government's record has shown time and time again the Tories don't believe Scotland to be an equal partner, yep. Yep. but a second class nation yep. worth only a second class treatment. Yep. 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 Throughout the entire negotiating period, the UK Government has treated Scotland with contempt. Yep. And you know, as I look around, and I can see shaking of heads, and I look at the chamber, I look in front of me. Where are the 13 Scottish Tory MPs yep. no. No. One that of were them to stand here. up for Scotland? In this debate, which is so crucial to Scotland's future, the Tories aren't just found wanting. They're simply not here. They've disappeared. I thank my right hon. friend for giving way. He is making an incredibly powerful speech. Will he agree with me on a matter of respect and a matter of contempt for the Scottish people and for our Parliament? If this Government and its MPs continue to treat Scotland with the kind of disrespect that we have seen throughout this Brexit process, it will only make independence <coughs> for Scotland more likely and come yeah, sooner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good news. Well, I, I, I thank my honourable friend for that, and I, I will make a, a prediction to this Parliament that Scotland will become an independent country. And I'll yeah. say simply, yeah. I'll, I'll say simply to, the, to the UK Parliament, is nodding. Keep going. First ambassador. You know, since we've come here, we've had English ambassador votes for English board. laws, we've had the power grab that's taking place, and the people of Scotland will yes. one day make their judgment on what is happening. Ambassador here, here. Mr Speaker, I want Thank to make some progress because I'm aware that many other people want to speak. Throughout the entire negotiating period, the UK Government has treated Scotland with contempt. Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain, yet the will of the Scottish people means nothing. Yes. Absolutely nothing to this Prime Minister. Instead of engaging meaningfully with Scotland during this critical time, the Prime Minister chose last-minute photocalls and stayed managed events in Scotland, all smoke and mirrors, yeah. to dress up the fact that her government couldn't care less about Scotland, and we can see it tonight. The Tories think they can do whatever they want to Scotland and get away with it. They think they can railroad this year against her will and against her interests. The mask has well and truly slipped here, here. for the Tories. Let me say this. Scotland is not a second-class nation, yeah. and our people do not deserve a second-class deal. Yeah. Here, here, here. This proposed deal is a non-starter, and a no-deal Brexit is unthinkable. That means the priority now must be to stop Brexit. And the SNP has made clear we will support any steps which would secure Scotland's place in the European Union, in line with the votes of the people of Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we've also said that if the UK is to leave the EU, by far away the least damaging option is to stay in the single market, which is eight times bigger than the UK alone and the customs union. We know what he's saying. He wants to stay within the European Union. How is he going to get out of the, the common fisheries policy? And what is he going to do for Scottish fishermen? Well, 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 Scottish fishing. You know, the reason that Scottish fishing was sold down the river in the 1970s was because Ted Heath, Ted Heath made sure that our fishing interests were sold out. And I have to say to him that, you know, in the deal that the government's brought forward, it's the worst of all deals, because in the transition period, the UK would remain in the Commons Fisheries Policy. Yes. But would have no effect on the rules. Absolutely. And if you look at what the European Union has made clear, because you're going to enter into a transition, but you're not holding any cards in terms of the future relationship. And the EU27 have said 
that the starting position for the negotiations of fishing will be one that they start from the existing quotas. The Scottish fishermen have been sold out, and they have been sold out by the Tories that have duped them that they were going to be taking back control of their waters. Nothing can be further from the truth. I am now going to make some progress. However, not content with ignoring the Scottish Government's compromise option for two years, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, now wants to shut Scotland's voice out entirely. The Prime Minister can't go on ignoring Scotland. Mr Speaker, tomorrow the Scottish Parliament will debate a cross-party motion that rejects this deal and a no-deal Brexit. Perhaps there are lessons for this place, because at Holyrood, parties have come together against a damaging Brexit, a consensus and a desire to work collectively to defend Scotland's interests. How many of the 13 Tory MPs from Scotland will stand up with us to defend Scotland's interests. Where are they? Not one. I think we know the answer from the failure of the Scottish Tory MPs to stand up against the paragraph when Westminster voted to take back control from the Scottish Parliament. We saw then when our powers over fishing, farming and the environment were to be trampled all over by Westminster, and yet the Scottish Tories turned a blind eye. Scottish Tories standing silent as Scotland's Parliament, our Parliament, that the people of Scotland voted for in such huge numbers in 1997, had its powers constrained. The Prime Minister boasts that her deal has support, but I say the Prime Minister, her deal does not have the support of the people of Scotland. Mr Speaker, a poll published earlier this year found that almost two-thirds of Scottish voters believe that the Westminster Government is ignoring their concerns during Brexit negotiations, and there is now more support in Scotland for remaining in the EU than at the time of the 2016 election. According to research for the People's Vote campaign, 66 per cent of Scottish voters support staying in the EU. The Prime Minister, like her predecessors, is out of step with the feelings of the Scottish people. And it's not just Scottish people. Countless experts and professionals right across the UK have said this is a bad deal. Mr Speaker, why is the Prime Minister not listening? The Prime Minister's proposed deal is unacceptable and it must be defeated in this House. 80,000 jobs will be put directly at risk in Scotland as a result of Brexit. And yeah, I can see ministers shaking their heads. But that's the analysis of the Fraser of Avondale, and indeed the UK government's own economic analysis points to the fact that a no-deal Brexit would damage the Scottish economy, would wipe out more than 8.5% of our GDP. How any government can impose these risks on Scotland is just simply breathtaking. The UK government's intention to end free movement of people will be hugely damaging to our economy. Correct. Inward migration has made an overwhelmingly positive contribution to Scotland's economy, meeting our needs for workers in sectors such as health and social care as well as in the tourism industry in the Highlands and Islands. Any reduction in EU migration could have a serious effect on Scotland's population growth and its demographic composition. In Scotland, all of the projected increase in our population over the next 25 years is due to migration. According to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, with 50 per cent less EU migration, the working age population would decline by almost 1 per cent, and the proportion of children would be declined by 4.3 per cent. This deal totally fails to meet Scotland's distinctive needs. I'm grateful to Jim for, for giving way. Just an example of exactly what he said came to my ears today. Um, there is a, a pilot who works for a Scottish airline who has a choice between having a strong EU Dutch passport or having a UK passport. Having a UK passport will mean he'll have to pay about £10,000 for himself and his wife and his children to stay in the UK and leave him with a weaker passport, or as he goes with a Dutch passport and works internationally in the airline industry. This is the very damage that the honourable gentleman is talking about that this government does not care about whatever it will do to the transport infrastructure of the Highlands. They will carry on blindly as they have been going. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's absolutely right. We must make this point right across Scotland. 
that there is an existential threat to our living standards, to our workers, and we must make sure that we stop Brexit. And if we can't stop Brexit for the United Kingdom, then we've got to take our own responsibilities to protect Scotland. Mr Speaker, Brexit uncertainty is already damaging our economy to the tune of £600 per household per year as the value of the pound falls and inflation rises. That's not project fear. That has happened. That's what's happened since we had the sheer responsibility of the Vote Leave campaign with ridiculous statements on the side of a bus promoted by the ex-Foreign Secretary who should be hanging his head in shame. There is, there is no certainty on the PM's deal on future trading arrangements for goods or services, no certainty on future mobility, no clarity on law, no guarantee on continued participation in EU funding programmes which support our universities, communities, NGOs and businesses. And uncertainty leads to risks for investment and further risks for our economy. By 2030, under a free trade agreement, GDP would be £9 billion lower than if we stayed in the European Union, equivalent to £1,600 per person in Scotland. That's what Brexit risks per year, per year making the people of Scotland poorer. That's why the Scottish National Party, in all good faith, has offered a compromise. If we are to be dragged out of the European Union against our will, then at the very least, at the very least, Mr Speaker, we must remain in the single market and the customs union to protect our economy. Without single market and customs union membership, the future relationship can only be a free trade agreement, introducing barriers to Scottish companies' abilities to trade. This will damage jobs, investment, productivity and earnings. The Government's own analysis provides Brexit, proves that Brexit is bad for Scotland. Trade volumes, GDP and wages would all fall, while government borrowing and trade costs would increase. All the analysis shows that in a no-deal scenario that it would be catastrophic and it is likely that the corporate sector in general is not well equipped to deal with a no-deal Brexit. Correct. It is more important than ever that we are not faced with a false choice between a bad deal and a no-deal. We need to have more time. We must extend Article 50 and take an alternative route yeah. to protect our economy. This deal and no deal are not options. Only those reckless enough to risk economic hardship will back this deal. Despite what the Prime Minister said here today, her own Chancellor agrees with the SNP when he admitted on Radio 4 that in economic terms we will be worse off after Brexit after, Brexit, after leaving the single market. Even more telling, Mr Speaker, is the admission from the Prime Minister herself in the House last week. The Prime Minister said in response to a member from, the member from Belfast North, what we want to be able to do is in the future be able to have our own independent trade policy. One of the issues in relation to the backstop is whether or not we would be able to do that, not one of the issues we would want to see continuing the backstop for. So the Prime Minister is clear. There is a concern from this Government over their ability to be able to strike and implement free trade deals if the backstop comes into force. Why then is the Prime Minister here arguing that this deal delivers? Mr Speaker, again I ask this House, how could we support a deal and back the Government on delivering an outcome that would make our economy smaller and our communities poorer? Mr Speaker, Government Ministers have tried to spin support in favour of this deal, citing the support from sectors across the United Kingdom. However, let me say this to those who believe that this deal is the only option. It is not, and we deserve better. Yeah. We know that frictionless trade at the border is crucial for Scotland's food and drink exports, but there is no guarantee of this, as under the deal, border checks and controls will depend on the extent of the UK's alignment with EU customs and regulatory regimes. Yet the declaration contains no commitment to a common rulebook on regulation. The SNP believes that our food and drink sector deserves assurance. They deserve cast-iron protections for their industry, not a false binary choice between a no Brexit and a blindfold Brexit. Yet again, another UK Tory government in Westminster has bargained off our fishing sector. Despite what utterances come from Number 10 as false assurances, the UK is reneging on its promises to support Scottish fishing by accepting a link between the UK waters 
and access to EU That's markets. The power grabs, its commitment to a separate fisheries agreement as part of the economic partnership could mean the UK ceding access for EU vessels to UK waters or accepting tariffs and customs barriers on trade in fish, seafood and farmed salmon with the EU. That, Mr Speaker, is not acceptable. This will mean once again Scottish interests being traded off against each other. This is absolutely unacceptable. And those in the Scottish Tories who profess to want to pr pr protect Scottish fishermen should hang their heads in shame. Here, here. If the Tories go through the lobbies to protect this government, they will have once again sold Scotland out for party political gain. And, Mr Speaker, they will not be forgiven for it. Here, here. The UK Government must respect the will of the Scottish people who voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. It is, Mr Speaker, a democratic outrage that Scotland has been dragged out of the European Union Correct. against its will. The withdrawal agreement sidelines Scotland and sells out our vital national industries. How could any representative in good conscience support such a move? Let me be clear. Next week, the SNP will reject the withdrawal agreement because it will leave Scotland poorer and rips opportunities away from future generations. Does the Prime Minister show any respect for our mandate at all? No. no. Does this Government have respect for the fact that every Scottish local authority voted Remain and the nation voted 62 per cent in favour of staying in the EU? No. no. Well, Mr Speaker, in Scotland we will make our voices heard once again. Northern Ireland has been given a differential deal that will put Scotland at a competitive disadvantage. There is no reason why a similar arrangement cannot be afforded to Scotland. The SNP will bring forward an amendment to ensure that in the place the voice of Scotland is well and truly heard. Those who claim to be Democrats, those who claim to have respect for the people of Scotland and for the mandate of the Scottish people and the Parliament cannot vote with the UK Government on this deal. It is clearer now than ever before that the only way the only way to protect Scotland's interest is to be an independent nation. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the First Minister has been very clear that she will set out the next steps in Scotland's future once the terms of the Brexit deal are Happy clear. Days. Yeah. The process of Brexit has demonstrated weaknesses in the UK's constitutional arrangements. Scotland has been ignored, sidelined and undermined through the entire Brexit process. The costs to the people in Scotland of not being independent have been laid bare. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, today is a moment of huge historical significance. A moment that for decades to come, people will remember what this place decided to do. If we as public representatives, with the responsibility to protect our communities and constituents, vote for a deal that will harm and hinder their opportunities, or if we stood up for them. Mr Speaker, this is no ordinary time in our history, and it is no ordinary time for our politics. Brexit has cast the politics of Westminster into a landscape of crumbling certainties. We are at a defining moment. We must stand up for our constituents. We cannot ignore the economic analysis. We cannot drive blindfolded off the cliff edge. We must take back control in this place. We must have the courage of our convictions and yield the power gifted us to do the right thing. We must stop this deal and this government from railroading recklessly over our rights, our freedoms and the opportunities for our people. There is another way. There is time, and we must take it. Yeah.